doubly delighted then to have Daniel with us and to have him talking on what really is a very interesting topic which is um, quite alive as he will tell us today uh, as well as at the moment that he was studying it back in the 80s. So without further ado, Daniel Rickenbach. People ask me, why history? Why, why in the 1970s? You know, you should be re do research on BDS. Yes. That's why it's in the title also. So uh, why is it important to, uh, to deal with history? Well, uh, a few practical reasons. I mean, uh, when we talk about contemporary politics, our understanding of contemporary politics is based on our understanding of history. So uh, that's why it's so important to fight about history. If, uh, so uh, I think it's very important to look at history. And there are also many practical reasons for looking at history, because it's easier to have, get a, to have a clear picture of the past than of the present. So uh, in the past, we can access archives. We can, uh, we can speak to witnesses, people who wouldn't, who wouldn't speak in the present about, uh, about these uh, circumstances. So uh, we get detailed information, for instance, from, from government agencies. We can look at the, at the archives, at wiretappings, things like this, and we get a detailed picture of things which are which were happening. While we don't know this about BDS, to some extent, of course, it is unique, but there are a lot of parallels. So uh, by comparing it to uh, the international anti-Zionist movement, we can gain a lot of insights into what is happening here in Canada. But let's start first. Uh, with the Six Day War. So uh, everybody of you knows this iconic picture here uh, of the Six Day, Six Day War, when Israel reclaimed the Western Wall. And uh, next to it is another picture, it's from Switzerland, from Bern. So we see in 1967, uh, there was uh, a lot of young, especially young people, the general population in Europe, also the non-Jewish population, expressed solidarity, even uh, enthusiasm uh, with Israel, with the Jewish state. Uh, there, were even, there were even Jewish volunteers in the small Jewish community, I know a couple of them, uh, who wanted to fight for the Israeli army. So there was a uh, big enthusiasm in the Jewish community and in the non-Jewish community for Israel. And uh, this reaction to the Six Day War in Western countries was actually was it was a disaster, public relations disaster for the Arabs. And they perceived it in this way. So uh, they intervened, for instance, diplomatically with, uh, with the governments. And for instance, for state media to be less biased in favor uh, of Israel. To, uh, and they also called on them to intervene with politicians to express, not to express solidarity with Israel. So beside the military fiasco for the Arab states, there was also this public relations fiasco for the Arab states. So in November 1967, the Arab information ministers, information of course here is... A, uh, in uh, 1967, the Arab information ministers, so actually the Arab propaganda ministers, they met to discuss their strategy, common strategy. So uh, they analyzed that the reaction uh, to the Six Day Wars was, uh, was a major problem for them, and especially the reaction of the left to the Six Day War. That the left, uh, that the majority of the left expressed solidarity with Israel. So, uh, actually, Fayez Sayek, he was an activist in a Californian university. I, I can't remember whether it's, the, I think it's Berkeley or Stanford. So, uh, he came up with this idea to uh, co opt marginalized groups. Uh, marginalized group meaning the new left, uh, black, Amer Amer black uh, Afri African Americans, uh, also uh, uh, left-wing churches. So he actually, before the Arab strategy, the Arab propaganda strategy was to win, gain, to win over the majority of the people, to win over the center. And now it changed, now they move to the marginalized people. And actually, this one has been a strategy which has been tried before in Germany, where the Arab League uh, did a lot of engagement work with students there. So this was actually a strategy which the Arab League and afterwards also the PLO adapted in Western countries. The uh, Arab League had a presence here in Canada since the 1950s. 
In the 1950s, the Arab League, which was then under the auspices of, the, of Egypt, established this international propaganda network. So they established Arab offices in Western countries, some African countries as well, because Israel was back then very much involved in Africa. They tried to gain them as a partner, as an ally. So, uh, who is the Arab League? Like, who comprises the Arab League? Well, the Arab League comprises actually all of the Arab countries. And it was uh, established in uh, late 1940-40. And then uh, it was practically, by then it was practically taken over by Egypt. Originally it was uh, supposed to be allied to the West, uh, but then Egypt turned it actually into a tool of, uh, of their foreign policy. So the Arab <laughs> League established all these propaganda offices in uh, first uh, in New York, then in other U in European countries, among others in Geneva, in Switzerland, which was the European headquarters, and then in different other capitals. So the Arab Information Office here in, uh, in Ottawa was established in 1959. And uh, yeah, the task was basically to uh, lobby with the government and uh, address the public. And first of all, also involved in propaganda against France, because then uh, there was the Algerian independence war. But later, actually, only Israel was really on their agenda. And since 1970, as a consequence of this, of this new strategy, a PLO officer, PLO officer was attached uh, to the Arab Information Office in Ottawa. And they also were connected to the Quebec anti-Zionists, about uh, whom I will talk later in the talk. And the PLO itself had a, established an office here in uh, here in Montreal, not in Quebec, uh, in 1982. And uh, beside these Arab actors, there were also a couple of local civil, civil groups here in Canada. So we had, we had the Canadian Arab, Arab Federation, which I believe still exists, uh, which was kind of an umbrella group for different anti-Zionist Arab groups uh, in Canada, operating all over Canada. And then we also had different Arab student groups, uh, which actually still exist at every major university. So these are the major Arab uh, actors here in Canada. And they're very important actors, but usually in histories of, uh, there are not many histories of anti-Zionism, but usually when people look at these movements, they only look at the left-wing actors. But the Arab actors are really important because they were a source of, uh, also of, uh, of money, of, uh, they coordinated some of the activities. They were really important to understand the anti-Zionist uh, build-up growth in the 1970s. So they were an actor then, and I'm sure they are an actor now, which uh, we have to look at. To visualize this, uh, we had all these Arab League of, in the 1970s, we, have, we had all these Arab League offices uh, in Western Europe and North America. We see here three Arab offices in, in the US, uh, one office in Canada. New picture, and in the 1970s, GUPS or uh, GUPS is the is the is kind of the the front group for the PLO. So this is the General Union of Palestinian Students. So uh, this group was uh, uh, had actually its stronghold in Germany since the 1960s, and uh, in the 19 uh, uh, in the late 1960s and 1970s, PLO representatives who worked with the with the GUPS or were a member of them. Uh, they uh, joined these Arab League offices all over Europe and in North America to coordinate their activity with them. So PLO and, uh, and the Arab League were working in coordination. And as you might know, since 1968, uh, PLO was, was practically Fatah, because Fatah took over the, uh, the PLO. So. Uh, in fact, they were all working together at these Arab information offices, and then they liaised with the local anti-Zionist scenes. So this was basically the story in every country. To, uh, to talk a little bit about the Canadian foreign policy towards the PLO, how they reacted to this kind of propaganda offensive, the Canadian government was very well aware uh, of these, uh, of these uh, developments. As it, you can see this in the record, so they were well informed about what was happening at the Arab Information Offices, offices because uh, among other things, these uh, offices were monitored by the RCMP. So the RCMP was very, uh, uh, very about, uh, was very concerned about these offices, 
especially in light of the 1976 Olympics. I, as you remember, in 1972 there was the Munich massacre, the Munich attack by uh, Black September, a faction of, of Fatah. And so they were, they were afraid that a, a scenario like this could repeat itself in Canada. So that's why they monitored it. The external affairs, on the other hand, uh, saw the PLO basically as a partner. So they wanted to, uh, they wanted a rapprochement between the PLO and Canada, because uh, they, they uh, got reports from their Canadian ambassadors in the Middle East that Canada, Canada was perceived as being too pro-Israeli, and this was harmful to their economic interests in the Middle East. So they wanted to distance Canada from the Middle East, uh, from Israel, and uh, move closer to the PLO. And they also prepared a memorandum. And there were different initiatives by, uh, by External Affairs and the Middle East Division. And actually, in uh, 1975, and, uh, the PLO invited to, uh, to attend a com UN conference in Toronto. Uh, and there was a lot of pressure by uh, by uh, Jewish organizations to uh, disinvite the PLO. And actually, initially, the government was against this, but then there was a terrorist attack, and Trudeau, who uh, the, the father, who had, who had initially uh, supported this rapprochement with the PLO, aborted these attempts, and uh, so it didn't happen eventually. And uh, as mentioned, mainly the reasons for this rapprochement was mainly uh, econo of economic nature, but also the idea was always uh, to uh, to prevent Canada becoming a, ter a target for terrorist attacks, especially in light, as mentioned, of the 1976 Olympics. And actually, the picture you see here that the domestic the security services were always uh, very skeptical of these organizations, while uh, external affairs of uh, foreign, of uh, foreign affairs always pushed for improving ties with the PLOs. So it's really an international picture. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, the scene uh, here in Quebec. And I'm also going to talk about the FLQ right on the next slide. So uh, the FLQ initially wasn't really interested in Palestine because the FLQ uh, wasn't really connected to the international uh, to left-wing movement. So it was only the fourth generation Pierre Valier, Charles, Charles Gagnon, who tried to connect uh, the, the FLQ with this international left-wing solidar solidarity network, uh, all these countries, Cuba and, uh, and Syria and, uh, and, these, and their issues. So uh, this, uh, this fourth generation of, uh, of, uh, of the FLQ was interested in the in uh, Palestine and in the Arab-Israeli conflict, and tried to connect with it. And you can also see this in uh, different uh, terror or in their planning. So, for instance, in the uh, 1970s, uh, in the 1970, the PLO, not the PLO, the FLQ, planned to abduct a Jewish, actually a Jewish diplomat, mastermind. I don't know if this is an accurate description, but. <laughs> uh, behind these attempts, he said, he said, uh, he said, he expressed himself in this way. He wanted to to kidnap a Jewish ambassador. So, uh, so they had these plans to uh, to abduct the Israeli diplomat. But actually, these plans uh, were revealed after a police raid found documents indicating uh, these plans. So they went for somebody else. But uh, you see that uh, the Palestine. Israel became more important for the FLQ in the 1970s. Uh, uh, so, and there was, there were also FLQ members which were training in uh, Palestinian terrorist camps in the 1970s. Uh, so, uh, the FLQ actually was training in Palestinian terrorist camps in the 1970s. So, there was some connection between uh, Palestinian terrorist organization or this uh, Palestinian cause and uh, Quebec militant nas or terrorist national. national yeah. And uh, we see also that many of the major, uh, major uh, anti-Zionist act activists here in Quebec came from this, uh, from this nationalist, left-wing nationalist uh, movement, uh, radical movement. Michel Chartreau. So, uh, but there are very few historians working in these fields, frankly. 
uh, that's uh, that's pretty also uh, an opportunity for me personally. But uh, that's the case. So, uh, but uh, interesting, uh, Michel Chartres uh, also had an anti-Semitic background. He was active in this mm -hmm. Catholic nationalist groups in the 1930s, <coughs> which were sympathetic to fascism. And uh, I gave a talk two weeks ago about this subject, where this subject where I spoke more about this. Uh, it's really a connection between uh, third world uh, national liberation solidarity movements, both here and in Europe, especially in Germany. And uh, this kind of uh, uh, both far right and new left identified with uh, third world national liberation movements. So uh, it's not always easy to say whether these arc activists were new left or far right. They are very similar. So Michel Chartre also had this background, and many of his fellow activists had this background. That they were originally they were from they were far right activists in the 1930s, 1940s, and then in the 1960s they become this big uh, socialist activists or uh, internationalist activists. So, so uh, in 1969, uh, the, the Quebec Palestine Palestine Committee was established in uh, was in, in, established at the University of Laval. And uh, Michel Chateau wasn't among the founders, but he was later involved in uh, this group. And he also established his own group in 1972, the so-called called Quebec Palestine Association. And he did this after it was actually established it very soon after uh, after the Munich massacre. And uh, he did so after meeting with Yasser Arafat. He there's a report on uh, his meeting. There are also pictures in the archives of. Uh, his Middle Eastern tour, he was in the Middle East. And then he also sh shot at Israeli airplanes in Lebanon. So uh, it, was a, it was kind of an adventure tour uh, for him. So uh, so he established this group in uh, 1972. And really, this Quebec Palestine Association was the most active anti Zionist group uh, here in Quebec uh, in the 1970s and pretty much uh, shaped the movement. Uh, he had some uh, Palestinian supporters, in, in particular Rezek Farage. Rezek Farage later became the head of the Quebec Palestine Association, and he has an interesting background, uh, Rezek Farage. He was, uh, before coming to Ca Canada in the late 1960s, he was for two years in Germany, and uh, was, uh, he was a student in Germany. And if you read about, uh, if you read about uh, German Palestinian students, in the 1960s, uh, if you read their memoirs, when the leader of them has left the memoir, actually all of them, or I would say, I can't speak for everyone, but usually they would be approached by the PLO by, or by their, or by Fatah's uh, branch, right, uh, correctly speaking, by Fatah's branch in Germany, the GUPS, General Union of Palestinian Students. So I think it's very likely that uh, he already had uh, Fatah connections from Germany when he came here. And the RCMP also suspected him to be a member of Black September. So this is the Black September is actually the special operations group of Fatah, which uh, planned these terrorist attacks like the Munich massacre. And he was also uh, somehow connected, uh, or he, I assume he was part of the reason why Canada was so fearful about a terrorist attack on, uh, on the 1976 Olympics here in uh, Montreal. In an RCMP report, I found uh, notes that Abdullah Abdullah, that was the PLO representative at the, at, the, at the Arab Information Office in Ottawa, tasked him with organizing some activities uh, to raise awareness for the Palestinian uh, armed struggle. So whatever that means. Uh, Michel Chartres is also an interesting figure. I mentioned that he had this, uh, in the 1930s, he had this, 1940s, he was basically a far-right anti-Semitic activist. He once praised, uh, he once praised fascism, but he also took, he also distanced himself from national socialism because he was said he was against Catholicism. So he didn't argue with anti-Semitism. His problem was that, uh, that uh, German National Socialism wasn't Catholic, 
It was more shaped by Protestants. That was basically his problem with uh, National Socialism. Uh, but nowadays, uh, nowadays uh, in Quebec, uh, Chartres is uh, remembered as this big social justice hero. So, so it's uh, you see this uh, this writer, for instance, Pierre Vadebonker. He wrote in 2001 that he was a pacifist, and he was always against war. So it's an interesting it's an interesting recollection. Because if you really look at what uh, Chartres said in the 1970s, for instance in 1972, and I have these quotes from uh, his, the journal of the uh, Palestine, the Quebec Association, Palestinian commanders in Munich were heroes. Uh, and he also said, for instance, we have to defend ourselves against the Zionist pollution in Quebec. So uh, he also dehumanized uh, Zionists or pro-Israeli Jews because they were Zionist pollutions, a very dehumanizing language. So he was hardly a pacifist. And you uh, find a lot of uh, similar statements from Michel Chartreau. And Esther de Lille has also written about this. But, uh, Esther de Lille, she uh, wrote about these subjects in the 1990s, about Quebec nationalism. And I think uh, in, in a lot of countries in the 1990s, people started to confront uh, their past of collaboration with, na with National Socialism. Uh, talking about, uh, for instance, in Switzerland, there was a big discussion on, uh, on uh, uh, how, how Jewish refugees weren't admitted to Switzerland. And there was even a special, uh, there was a special commission uh, doing research on this. So different countries had this discussion, the, uh, these discussions about their past, about their activity, about how they dealt with the Holocaust with National Socialism in the 1930s, 40s. But uh, in contrast uh, to Quebec, they didn't, the people who wanted to uh, prevent this de debate didn't win. And uh, here it seems in Quebec, this, uh, the people who wanted to prevent this debate kind of won. It uh, seems very bizarre to me that this, uh, that, uh, that, uh, this past should, be, should still be a taboo. That's very bizarre to me. But nevertheless, uh, Esther Elici also already wrote about, uh, about Michel Chartron, that actually all of his, uh, that all these accounts about his life are actually of a geographic nature. So nobody, had, or very few people, I mean, there are some historians who are looking at this, and these are also historians uh, whom I quote in my work. Some historians are looking at this, but largely, the literature about him is uh, is produced by fans. So uh, it was also um, far to the left, or whatever you call this uh, political position uh, of uh, of uh, of the PQ. So uh, so Chartreau, yeah, is his own person. Interesting that also I spoke about the Arab League, and but there were also other. The PLO, but there were also other actors, Arab actors, involved here uh, in Canada. Libya, who would think? Libya, what does Libya care about? Quebec, nevertheless, uh, they were involved here. But uh, the thing is, uh, you, mu you must understand the Arab, Arab uh, governments uh, and the Palestinian cause. There was also a competition between the different Arab states who's the advocate of the Palestinians. So, uh, the, Libya was also involved here, because it, there's this inter-Arab competition, who's the, who's the defendant of the Palestinian cause, or they used to be. And originally it was Egypt and Nasser in particular, but after the Six Day War, uh, Nasser's position was weakened, Egypt's position was weakened, so other countries uh, sought to become the, the defenders of the Palestinian cause. So this was really a, a question of prestige. So for instance, Libya. So Libya became very much involved, supporting Palestinian terrorist groups and also supporting human rights groups uh, advocating the Palestinian cause. So uh, in 1976, there was this international symposium on Zionism and racism, and a number of people from Canada uh, attended this human rights conference, uh, which was uh, organized uh, under the auspices of uh, Gaddafi. And Gaddafi. Gaddafi had this human rights conference organized and a number of people from Quebec 
uh, attended this conference. I believe AC for or from Canada, AC Forest, uh, which uh, some of you may, might know. He was a he was a was a Protestant anti-Zionist mm -hmm. activist. Uh, then uh, Klau Hermann, Klaus Hermann, which I was know, a, I knew him well. Which was a colleague of you. Yes. Uh, and uh, and also Chartreau, Rezek Farage, and Ivan Charbonneau. Ivan Charbonneau, another trade union activist, a uh, member of the teachers union here in Quebec. And uh, after this conference, they uh, established this human rights anti racist group. Uh, it was called EFORT. International organizations for the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. And uh, here in, Ke in uh, 1977, they also established a local chapter here, uh, which was headed by Yvonne Charbonneau. So, what they try to do, which is very modern, and that's why I say it's very important to understand history, to uh, understand contemporary, uh, contemporary phenomena, which basically what we see. I've, and many things we, uh, we see today are just recurrences of uh, things we've seen in the past. And actually, with this framing of the Arab, uh, of the Arab Israeli conflict in the language of anti racism, anti imperialism, is, a, is, a, is an invention of the 1970s. So, uh, and th this is with us, this is uh, really current. So, uh, to understand, when, if you understand its origins, we also understand its motives and its falsehoods, basically. So, uh, so they try to frame the conflict in this uh, in this vein. And here I found a nice picture of the of the meeting, or the first or the foundation meeting of uh, of EFOR. So this is uh, in Tripoli, Libya. And here, if you uh, if you have good eyes, and if you don't, you have to come closer. So uh, what you see on the right is Gaddafi. Yeah, Gaddafi, oh, yeah. the handsome young man there. That's Gaddafi. Across the table is Abdullah Sharaf al -Din. That's the head of E4, so uh, of this anti-racist organization. And I didn't spot any Quebec people here, but maybe you're better. Maybe you, so you can spot some Quebec people. I have this from an Arab newspaper, so uh, which is online. I found this picture in an Arab newspaper. So you can see uh, Gaddafi, of course, I mean, it's a totalitarian re regime. You can't establish any organization with, with, without Gaddafi's consent. And he was involved from the beginning. He was even at their establishment. So, uh, so this, is part of their, this is part of this new strategy. Arab, the Arab countries seek to frame Israel as a racist country. Soviet Union does it as well, and they try to connect it to apartheid in South Africa, which is also something which is still with us. So uh, it's uh, you see all actually the, the current anti-Zionist anti-Semitic movement is not very inno innovative. So uh, most of the concepts they have uh, have been with us for decades. And uh, in 1975, there was also this UN condemnation of Zionism as a racist ideology. And you can also understand this, 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 uh, this effort to connect Israel to apartheid. You can understand it as a, as a, as a framing or as a, as a strategy to connect the anti-apartheid movement, to the anti-racist movement, to the new left in Western countries, but also to African countries. Because I mentioned it briefly before, in this period of time, uh, Israel did a lot of outreach toward African countries. Golda Meir did a lot of outreach. So they sent, uh, they invested in development aid in Africa. They, they wanted to, it was part of this peripheral strategy, but to gain allies against the Arab countries. And uh, they wanted to counter this, the Arab countries and the Arab League, so they, this was very useful for them to counter it. So. Uh, that was basically behind. There are a lot of different ideologies in this, but uh, in, contained in this uh, new left uh, or Western or this anti Zionism. So, it's, uh, to summarize, we have all these different groups. We have here in the anti Zionist group, wasn't only, uh, wasn't only, uh, you know, wasn't only uh, represented by uh, 
but the left, but uh, of the anti-Zionist scene, we had a lot of different actors. We had the gay nationalists. We had uh, new left trade unions, which were active in it. We had communist groups, which I haven't talked about uh, so much during this talk. Then we had all the Arab diaspora, which was involved in the anti-Zionist uh, movement here in Canada. Student groups, the Federation of Ca the Canadian Arab Federation. And then we had uh, different state actors, Libya, Arab League, PLO. So this was really a, this was really kind of an alliance, an anti-science alliance. So uh, I think we still, f if we really take a close look, we still find this. So uh, I'm actually finished with my talk. Maybe some questions. Yes, please go ahead. And you could expand on your analysis via the questions. Right? Um, there's a number of, uh, of uh, Arab and Islamic organizations, you know, NGOs, advocacy groups now in Canada. Some of them are um, operating as if they were mere advocacy groups or charities or, you know, um, and it seems sometimes that the government can't distinguish between which uh, have a deeper agenda and, and which, you know, the, the, the national Council of Canadian Muslims, which is used to be called CARE Canada. Okay. Um, and then there's a group that I actually want, I have a specific reason for asking you about, um, Islamic Relief Worldwide, which is a charity dispense, they have a very big budget, they dispense, you know, their, 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 their stated agenda is poverty remission and helping with hunger all over the world and all that, but um, they are also associated with the Muslim Brotherhood and and the Muslim Brotherhood is very entrenched here also in the Muslim Student Associations and all that. That wasn't in the 70s, was it? I mean, that was coming. That was, mm -hmm. was it already established? The Well, there's the Muslim Student Association, which is associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. Then there's the uh, Muslim Association of Canada. Uh, there's there's one group that in, I told you interest. If you, I, are there some of these groups that are we should be more concerned about than others? Like, which are the more benign, which are... Worrisome? I think the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, certainly wor worrisome. It is worrisome. So, certainly. Yes. I mean, the Muslim Brotherhood is an anti Semitic organization. Yes, it is. And actually, uh, well, the, uh, one of the central. The Muslim Brotherhood is lower of their ideology, it's conspiracy theory that there's a. that there's a. that there's a conspiracy against Islam by the Jews and uh, the, West, the Western Crusaders. That's at the heart of their uh, worldview. So. I think they're very, they're of course, a very dangerous group. But to answer this, so I think they are certainly not benign, and they are dangerous to Jews everywhere where they are, and they radicalize to if you Muslim community. Are any of these advocacy groups actually benign, or are they all, in one way or another, fronts for? Well, I can't speak for everybody. I mean, uh, maybe they are benign groups, but uh, many of these. I mean, I, I'm uh, more familiar with the with the groups in Switzerland, frankly. And most of the Muslim communities in Switzerland, it's a little bit different than here because I believe here most of the people are from Arab countries. Uh, in Switzerland, it's actually the case if you look close at most of the groups, practically all the groups, they are connected to their home countries. And they are connected to the, to the groups which are active in their home countries. And uh, the groups which usually invested in, uh, in the diaspora are the Islamists. So, for instance, the, the Turk, the Turks, Turkish community is connected to Turkish Islamists. It's uh, Dianit, and uh, which is the official organization which has now been Islamized by Erdogan, and uh, and then uh, and Mile Kurush, uh, Mile Kurush, which, which is also a right far right uh, Islamist organization in Turkey. So, and then we have we have Arab groups which are connected to Muslim Brotherhood. So usually they are connected to their home countries. And I would be very surprised if the scene was different here in Canada. So I guess Bangladeshis are, uh, are connected to Bangladeshis, and most of them connected to Bangladesh. And, well. If you look at BDS, for instance, right, the BDS movement, if, it's, if it is a movement designed to in somehow or other have an impact on Israel economically, it's, it's total failure. Purpose is propaganda here and dealing with students the here. Purpose is to normalize hatred of right. Israel. But going back to, to the period that you're talking about, mm -hmm. and I don't think it's historically correct to um, tie together the present situation with that. These groups were just as much <coughs> a failure long term as, a, as the Parti Québécois was a failure. Mm -hmm. and 
they tried to feed on the inferiority complexes of the French Canadians, the Arabs, and uh, they were not strong enough, those inferiority, inferiority complexes, to gain very much um, power in Canada. I mean, when you look at, I think the uh, Parti Québécois has seven members in the uh, Quebec legislature today. And if you look back to the 1970s, who would have predicted that then? Mm. Yeah, it seems to be that position. But uh, I think the, the answer is mixed. Uh, uh, for once you're certain, you have this normalization of anti-Semitism. In particular, in North America, you also have this normalization of Islamism, mm -hmm. which, uh, which seems to be a uh, taboo. And we know about Islamist or Islamic anti-Semitism. It's not a taboo. We talk about it. Here, so, very delicate. Very so uh, mm -hmm. that it's so delicate in uh, in Canada and North America is something which which uh, which I find very very some worrying. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, what you mentioned, I mean, they didn't achieve complete success uh, because uh, I mean they wanted to isolate they wanted to destroy Israel basically. Mm -hmm. They want to isolate Israel. And I mean, uh, Quebec now has good relations with uh, with Israel. Uh, Quebec has good relations. The economic position, as uh, as uh, Professor Kranz mentioned, is very strong. Israel BDS doesn't seem to have much impact, mm -hmm. and uh, so they didn't. Certainly, they didn't achieve what they wanted. But they discover in the course of this somehow, and by the the nineties, it's changing. That what you try and do is to create the notion, and that's the new anti-Semitism. It's mm -hmm. the whole concept of the new anti-Semitism. You're not opposed to Israel as a state somehow, you're opposed to Jews. That it's a Jewish state, and as a Jewish state, there's something wrong with it. And so it's the old anti-Semitism sure. now coming back in a politicized form. You couldn't be opposed to a Jewish state in 1930 or 40 or 50 because it wasn't one. So you were rather rough, straightforward, you were opposed to Jews. Uh -huh. All right? Now, of course, you have the Jewish state, so we're not opposed to Jews. That's anti-Semitic. We're not anti-Semitic. Uh, why do you think Quebec failed in confronting its, its past back in the 1990s? Is it because they see themselves somewhat as a colonized society that doesn't have to deal with its own uh, shortcomings? Or, or is it uh, because... And, and, and Austria is doing it now, so, mm -hmm. so I'm wondering why Quebec would not succeed. And the other question for both of did you do when you saw your friends? You got off, but you got out of the left very quickly. Very quickly. <laughs> you got out. Yeah, of course. If, if you had any intellectual honesty, at a certain point, I'm sorry to answer the question first, but you, you realize that it began, it, it began for many of us with the 67 war, when our so-called left-wing allies are condemning Israel for winning the war. Yeah. And you say, what, there's something wrong here. I mean, mm. it's like, Israel was the aggressed party, mm -hmm. and luckily she won the war, and now your colleagues in the labor movement and in politics and the new left are telling you that this is a tragedy? What, what tragedy? And you really begin to, to wake up a little bit, right? And then you, you, you look at the world and point, you get off the boat. But and it wasn't easy. By the way, I wanted to say something about this issue of, uh, you know, what did you do when things began to change on campus and you know, how do you deal with uh, freedom of speech issue. This guy who was mentioned here, Klaus Herman, okay, give me one, one minute, just, he was a colleague of mine. I came as a young, fairly young guy and met this guy. He liked me because I spoke some German. He was a German Jew, reformed Jew, anti-Zionist. You know, he survived the Holocaust in, in Hong Kong. He got to China and he, he, he survived by being a Shechet. He, was a, he had reform, he was a reform rabbi, if you can imagine, German reform. United States, from the United States he gets to Canada. And Canada, in the US he gets a degree, he got a PhD somewhere in political science, and he was hired by Sir George Williams University. He comes here and he teaches political science. And one of his courses is Know the Zionist Enemy. He teaches a, an anti-Zionist course. Okay. And I come on campus, and he hears about me, and he comes to see me, and I don't know who the hell he is, right? And we're talking, and he knows a lot about Israel, and things Jewish, and he's a survivor. And slowly it comes out that, you know, he's not exactly my cup of tea, right? Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but he, and, and we, were, we were friendly anyway, in a peculiar way. And um, 
he teaches a course in anti-Zionism, and he tells lies, from my point of view. This is a right? legitimate And students course. are always, yes, a legitimate course, and students are complaining, Jewish students were complaining to the chairman of his department, to the dean, and they were saying he has the right to his point of view. And it's better to let him have his point of view than to suppress him, because if, if he can be suppressed, so can you be suppressed. So the doctrine of free speech cuts both ways, and the, 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 the negatives are, are greater than the positive. The thing I could really use study is the Canadian appropriation, both governmental and in terms of universities, the Canadian appropriation of the American First Amendment mentality to justify administrative inaction. Okay? That's what's going on.